This is Revelation chapter 12, part 3. Now, I have spent a fair bit of time introducing Revelation 12 and explaining who the players are. Now, I want to unravel the specifics of the prophecy. Revelation 12, verse 2. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. The next thing I want to look at is this woman travailing in birth and being in pain to be delivered. We already saw that this was an identifying mark with the family of Israel, but there is also a prophetic time aspect connected to this. Now, I don't want to be dogmatic on the terminology I'm about to use, but in a sense, the New Testament church was conceived on the day of Pentecost, about AD 33, with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. At least, this was its definite beginning point. Now, the normal gestation period of a woman with child is 280 days. Considering the matter historically, from the beginning of the church, there immediately followed persecution and travail, which did not end until the Edict of Milan in AD 313, which was 200, 280 years later on a day for a year scale in relation to Bible prophecy, and this is significant. This whole period of 280 years was marked with the persecution of the body of Christ the burning of the Christians, the feeding of them to the lions for entertainment, and so on and so on. Historically, this period is also marked out by ten great imperial persecutions under pagan Rome, climaxing with the tenth and most fierce, widespread and systematic persecution of Christians, which began under the Emperor Diocletian and lasted for ten years. So, as a woman comes near to the time of delivery of her child, her birth pangs become greater and more regular, and so it was with the final, final and greatest of all pagan Roman persecutions, the Great or Diocletianic Persecution, which lasted for 10 years from AD 303 to 313. And you may recall we looked at this already when we spoke of the church period signified by the church in Smyrna in Revelation 2 verse 10, and also that which is given to us under the fifth seal in Revelation chapter 6, where we saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. At the expiration of the days of travailing in birth and being in pain to be delivered came the Edict of Milan, which was an edict of toleration towards Christians signed by the emperors Constantine and Licinius and came into effect in March AD 313. And initially this was only in two-thirds of the Roman Empire, that is the European and African parts. The remaining third or Asiatic part was under the control of the Emperor Maximum and he, seeing what had happened with Constantine and Licinius, renewed persecutions against the Christians within his limits. And he also made war against Licinius and Constantine, but was defeated by Licinius three or four months later. And then in the summer of AD 313, Maximum died, confessing himself vanquished. Herein do we see what is being set forth in the prophecy. Revelation 12 verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. This great red dragon is the fourth world empire, and here in Revelation chapter 12 it is being set forth in its pagan Roman form. It is the same beast as in Daniel chapter 9, which is shown to have ten horns, but again in Revelation 12, what we are looking at here is pagan Rome. We note here in this chapter that the crowns are upon the seven heads and not on the, and not on the ten horns. When we get to Revelation chapter 13, you will see that the crowns have been transferred from the seven heads to the ten horns, and that is the point when we are dealing with the beast, the fourth world empire, in its papal form. And so as to cover the scriptures, here we read Daniel, from Daniel 7 verse 7, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, 
dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. In Daniel 7, the fourth beast is shown with ten horns. In Revelation 12, the fourth beast is depicted as a great red dragon with seven heads with crowns upon those heads and also with ten horns which are as yet uncrowned. The reason for the difference between Daniel 7 and Revelation 12 is simply that Revelation 12 is providing us with more information about the fourth beast and is specifically looking at its pagan form. Its papal form is taken up in Revelation chapter 13. This is one of the reasons why Revelation 12 is the center point of the entire book and marks the spot where the scroll is turned over to read the other side. Revelation 12 tells us of the seven heads of the dragon. In Revelation 17 verse 9 we read, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. In Bible prophecy, a mountain is a very well-known symbol for an empire, kingdom, or government. Now, ancient pagan Rome is recognized to have had seven distinct forms of governmental structures, and this is what is being symbolized by the seven heads of the dragon. These seven heads were, number one, kings, number two, consuls, number three, dictators, number four, Decemivers, which was a member of a council of ten magistrates in ancient Rome, number five, military tribunes, number six, those which we are most familiar with, the imperial Caesars, also known as military emperors, and lastly, number seven, there were the despotic emperors. The ten horns which are also shown are as yet uncrowned, and they come forward into the picture when we get to Revelation chapter 13 and the Papal Roman Empire, and I'm going to deal with this when I get there. Coming back to Revelation 17 verse 9, which says that the seven heads are seven mountains, while it is correct to say that these mountains are biblical symbols used to designate kingdoms or governments, it is also an inescapable fact that the city of Rome has been known down through history as the city of seven hills. And here we see a coin of ancient Rome showing a woman typifying the Roman Empire leaning back, seated on seven hills. These seven hills are the seven hills of Rome. This city, which was vacated by the Roman emperors from the time of Constantine I onwards, was subsequently occupied and headquartered by the papacy with the Pope of Rome, and the direct connection between pagan Rome and papal Rome cannot be doubted. And for the sake of completeness, the names of the seven hills of Rome are shown here, and I will dare to venture to pronounce their names. They are Aventine, Calian, Capitoline, Esquiline, Palatine, Quirinal, and lastly, Viminal. The next thing to note about these seven crowns is that it is the Greek word diadema for crown that is used here, and this appears to be a pointer to the time period with which this vision is directing our attention. Now, I hope you recall that when we looked at Revelation chapter 6, part 1, we saw that the rider of the white horse had a crown upon his head, and we noted that the word for crown used there was the Greek word stephanos, which refers, which refers to the laurel wreath of the military emperors or imperial Caesars. And we know that it was not until the close of the 3rd century AD that this laurel wreath was swapped out by the emperors in favour of the diadema, which refers to the jewelled crown. In the book, The Visions of the Revelation, explained by E.P. Kashimau, the writer speaks of this crown, the Stephanos, and he says this, The distinction between the crown and the diadem is carefully observed in these visions and is of great importance in their interpretation in regard to the date of the particular era symbolized. The crown, or laurel wreath, was the badge of earthly conquest and of imperial supremacy, and from the time of Augustus, BC 29, 
the wearing of the crown was all but withdrawn from subordinate generals as too great an honour. From the accession of Domitian, AD 81, it was appropriated to the reigning emperor as his own proper distinction. Not till the time of Diocletian, AD 292, was the diadem adopted by Roman emperors, this innovation being accompanied with other tokens of Oriental royalty. The change marked an epoch in Roman history. From thenceforward, but not till then, the diadem became the imperial badge, for a century more conjointly with the laurel crown, and then alone. Eliot also writes about this in the Horae Apocalypticae, and he says this, The assumption of the diadem, or broad white fillet set with pearls, viewed as it was by the Romans as a badge of oriental despotism and of the servitude of subject vassals these emperors carefully shunned. In fact, not till about the time of Diocletian, near 200 years after St. John's banishment to Patmos, was the diadem adopted by Roman emperors. And one last quote on this point, Edward Gibbon said, The pride, or rather the policy, of Diocletian engaged that artful prince to introduce the stately magnificence of the court of Persia. He ventured to assume the diadem, an ornament detested by the Romans as the odious ensign of royalty. So once again, the fact that Revelation 12 uses the Greek word diadem for crown seems to be a pointer to the time period in view by the prophecy, and that is the point from Diocletian onwards until the fall of pagan Rome with the Christianization of the Roman Empire. Connected with the diadem we have just been talking about, I also wish to bring this together with the symbol of the dragon which is here depicting pagan Rome. The fact that the dragon of Revelation 12 is depicting pagan Rome shows us that it is a satanically controlled kingdom. As a military power, Rome is symbolized by a war horse, and we looked at that aspect in Revelation chapter 6. But as a persecuting power, it is depicted as a dragon, and that is what we have before us here. Pagan Rome is persecuting the woman and the man-child. Now what I want to do next is show that this dragon symbol, coupled together with the use of the diadem in Revelation 12, further narrows down the time period to which the prophecy is drawing our attention. From this fresco painting found in the Vatican by Raffaello, we can see depicted the triumph of Constantine and Christianity over pagan Rome. Pagan Rome is shown as a winged dragon and this is also the imagery used in Revelation chapter 12. Also highlighted here is Constantine's so-called vision of the cross. Beneath the dragon you can see the Milvian Bridge, which was taken by Constantine on the 28th of October, AD 312. Now, as you might recall, we looked at this in Revelation 6, part 6. The Milvian Bridge was strategically important and the holding of it was necessary to prevent Constantine and his forces from entering Rome. Maxentius and his armies who were holding this bridge fled for their lives as Constantine approached bearing the labyrinth with the chi ro atop it, and we have discussed this previously. As you can appreciate, this painting was done during the heyday of the papacy, and so there are a lot of other things shown in this painting which are quite questionable. The point of including it here is simply to show that the association of pagan Rome with the dragon is the correct one. One also needs to realise that the association of the dragon with papal Rome, which emerged from the ashes of pagan Rome, is also known. Papal Rome continued the work of the dragon but did it under the guise of professing Christianity. Also concerning the imagery of the dragon in connection with pagan Rome, we read this from a Wikipedia article. The Draco, dragon or serpent, plural dracones, was a military standard of the Roman cavalry. Carried by the Draconarius, the Draco was the standard of the cohort as the eagle, Aquila was that of the legion. The Draco may have been introduced to the Roman cavalry by Sarmatian units in the 2nd century. According to Vegetius, in the 4th century, a Draco was carried by each legionary cohort. 
So let us note here from this article, the fact that the Draco symbol was not a symbol used to signify Rome in its early days, but that it came later. In the Horae Apocalyptica Volume 3, Eliot points out that the association of the symbol of the dragon with Rome did not come into existence until the close of the 2nd century AD, and this coupled together with the fact that the prophecy refers to the Greek word diadema for crowns on the seven heads and not Stephanos for the laurel wreath, and I hope you recall that we discussed this previously, when we take these two things together, it narrows down the time period of the prophecy uh, to the period near to the fall of paganism and the rise of Christianity to the seat of the empire. So Eliot says, It was not till near the close of the 2nd century that the dragon was first used as a Roman ensign, nor till the 3rd that its use had become common. A chronological indication of the same kind, but yet more restrictive, appears in the use of diadems, not crowns, on the heads of the dragon, in signification of royal or ruling power. It was not till the time of Diocletian, at or just after the close of the 3rd century, that the diadem was adopted as one of the imperial insignia, an innovation accompanied with others so important as to constitute an epoch in the Roman imperial history. And to conclude this thought concerning the time period to which the prophecy is drawing our attention, E.P. Cashemail summarizes the matter in his book called The Visions of Daniel and the Revelation Explained and says this, A purple red dragon was one of Imperial Rome's military standards but not used till near the close of the 2nd century, nor become common till the 3rd. The date to which this particular vision belongs is therefore most precisely defined by the symbolism of the dragon. He wears diadems, therefore under this aspect he belongs to a date not earlier than AD 292, when the diadem was adopted as the official badge of the empire. He is the dragon, therefore cannot appropriately represent the Roman Empire after it became by profession Christian in the time of Constantine, AD 324. The next thing I would like to deal with is the heaven being spoken of in Revelation chapter 12, as I believe that this will greatly help with a clearer understanding of what the prophecy is referring to. And I'm going to say, right off the bat, that it is not referring to the heaven of God's abode. And of course, there is such a place, but that is not what is being referred to in this chapter. It is not talking about the sweet by and by and other such things. But we need to carefully note what chapter 12 says about this. Revelation 12 verse 1 tells us that the woman was in heaven, Verse 2 tells us that she was with child in heaven. Verse 3 tells us there was this great red dragon in heaven. And verse 7 also tells us there was war in heaven. All these things are in heaven. The futurists take a literalist approach to the book of Revelation, as you are probably aware. They boast that this makes them more faithful to the word of God as they take God at his word. So when Revelation 12, in this case, speaks of heaven, this can only mean the place of God's abode. They believe that the literalist approach is the only way of properly understanding these prophecies, even though the book of Revelation says at its very outset, in chapter 1, verse 1, that it is in fact given in signs and symbols. On this point, Revelation 1 verse 1 is ignored and the language of prophecy used throughout the Bible is pushed aside by futurists in favour of a literalist approach. So then, what about the, the heaven of Revelation 12? Again, remember, all these things which we have just looked at are in heaven. So let me ask the futurists, at what time, past, present or future, do they expect to find a pregnant woman in heaven? Clearly, something else is intended to be understood by this, 
and it becomes a relatively simple matter of finding this out by letting the Bible interpret itself. The heaven of chapter 12 is the same heaven that we have already come across before several times in the book of Revelation, and that is that elevated sphere of control, government and rulership over the nations of the earth. And this is quite simply the language of the prophets, and we must let the Bible interpret itself, otherwise the prophecy becomes meaningless. In Revelation 6 verse 13, we saw previously that under the sixth seal, the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, and that was talking about the collapse of the pagan Roman Empire. That description was continued in verse 14, which said, The heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Again, that was referring to the collapse of the pagan Roman Empire and it being eclipsed by Christianity. In Revelation 8 verse 1, we saw that there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And that was speaking about the calm in the Western Roman Empire just before the Gothic invasions got underway. Also, in Revelation 9 verse 1, we saw a star fall from heaven. And this was the coming forth of Muhammad after being cast out of the ruling family of the nation at that time. Now, if you are not familiar with all of these things, then please ensure that you go back to these earlier parts because we look at each of these matters in a lot of detail. And I will also add a fifth witness to this, and that is Revelation 11 verse 12, which tells us of the two witnesses who ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. We saw that how, that as a result of the outbreak of the European Reformation, that the reformers found the favor of princes and governments. The heaven they ascended to was the heaven of political authority, and this is the same meaning we have been finding throughout the book of Revelation. They were now embraced and protected by those who had been their former persecutors and in many cases they were being preserved from the wrath of the dragon seated in Rome. Also for your edification, I invite you to view my series called The Thief on the Cross. And in part two, you will find that I speak about the heavens and the earth. And what you will find is that the meaning of these things in relation to the kingdoms of this world remains the same. And it will further demonstrate that what I am setting forth here is consistent with the rest of Scripture. And I want to hasten to add that I am not for one moment questioning the heaven of God's abode. So please don't confuse one thing with another. So what we are dealing with here in Revelation 12 is a tremendous struggle between paganism and Christianity that was going on in the Roman Empire. It was a spiritual struggle for dominion over the Roman earth of prophecy. That God's people are wrestling against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, is Bible 101. And in Daniel chapter 10, we read of a earlier spiritual struggle in the Persian Empire. It says in Daniel 10 verse 13, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I am come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of Daniel chapter 10, as I've dealt with that in a separate series. The point is that there are spiritual struggles going on in the heavenlies, in the kingdoms of this world. So as we come to Revelation chapter 12, we have another great struggle set before us. And it is a spiritual struggle that is working itself out in the temporal affairs of the Roman earth. And to find this should come as no surprise to any Christian. With all of that in mind, and now reading from Revelation 12 verse 7, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, 
that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So there was great conflict going on in the Roman earth of prophecy, and in this case it was in the heavenlies of the Roman Empire, in the rulership of the empire. Jesus Christ, called Michael here, was fighting for his people against the dragon, which was manifesting itself in pagan Rome. The dragon was attempting to devour the man-child, the body of Christ, the church, through ten great pagan persecutions, the last of which was the Diocletianic persecution, which lasted for ten years and was the most fierce and widespread of all of these persecutions, as the Roman Emperor sought to utterly erad eradicate Christianity from the Empire. But what transpired? Just when it looked as though all hope was lost, pagan Rome collapsed. The destruction of Christianity was not to be. Despite the full force of the Roman Empire being brought to bear against it, what happened? We read in verse 1, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. In verse 2, She was found with child, and she was travailing in birth, and, and was in pain to be delivered. There was tremendous persecution and opposition. It was a time of great tribulation, but what happened? She brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. The destiny of the church, the body of Christ, was not to be smashed to pieces, but rather to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and to be caught up to God and to his throne. And so it was that admit amidst the last and greatest of all pagan Roman persecutions, pagan Rome collapsed and its leaders literally fled before the labyrinth, showing the chi ro, the first and last letters of the name of Jesus Christ. The fall of paganism from the ruling power of the Roman Empire and its replacement with Christianity is a major epoch in world history and if you are not familiar with these details, I invite you to go back and look at my series on Revelation chapter 6 and take in parts 5 and 6 in particular. And there you will find, in one of the many quotes, we have a quote there from Edward Gibbon who talks about the destruction of, the, of pagan religion in the Roman Empire, AD 378 to 395. And he writes, the ruin of paganism in the age of Theodosius is perhaps the only example of the total extirpation of any ancient and popular superstition and may therefore deserve to be considered as a singular event in the history of the human mind. That's how significant this event is and that is what is being set before us in Revelation chapter 12. We're talking about this woman travailing to bring forth a man-child. Then there is this dragon ready to devour the man-child as soon as it is born. We have seen that there was this tremendous effort within the Roman Empire to utterly eradicate Christianity from its realms and to restore the pagan religion of Rome to its place of prominence. Here we see a coin of Maximian, co-regent with Diocletian, and it shows Maximian as Hercules with a club in his hand, beating to death a seven-headed hydra. This hydra depicts the myriad of problems that the Roman emperor was dealing with and overcoming, and this included not only the persecution of Christianity, but its killing altogether. The travail of the woman was to be long, and intense, and the closer she came to delivering her child, the more intense and frequent the pain became, but the child was delivered. Paganism was thrown down, and Christianity was raised to the seat of the empire in one of the most dramatic changes that has ever occurred in world history. As we have seen already, as a woman is with child for 280 days, there was 280 years of travail of the sun-clothed woman between the beginning of the church in AD 33 to it being delivered from pagan persecution in AD 313. 
In AD 313, there was the Edict of Milan and the end of Christian persecution at that time. Following this, Christianity, the church was caught up into the rulership of the empire, into the political heaven, as is being symbolized here, and at the same time, the dragon was cast out. Paganism was eradicated from the empire in the decades that followed. This epic story is captured in this quote taken from a book called The Story of Civilization Part 3, Caesar and Christ by Will Durant, in which the author says, There is no greater drama in human record than the sight of a few Christians, scorned or oppressed by a succession of emperors, bearing all trials with a fierce tenacity, multiplying quietly building order while their enemies generated chaos, fighting the sword with the word, brutality with hope, and at last defeating the strongest state that history has known. Caesar and Christ had met in the arena, and Christ had won. As we saw previously in Revelation 6, Part 6, with the coming forth of Constantine the Great, pagan Rome was crushed and Christianity was seated on the throne of the empire. In this coin of Constantine, we see the labyrinth piercing the serpent, that old serpent, the devil. The labyrinth was the military standard used by the armies of Constantine when they fought against the pagan armies of Rome. And on top of the labyrinth, you can see the chi rho, which is the letters XP, and this is formed from the first two Greek letters for the word Christ. Before this standard, the armies defending paganism ran in fear for their lives. The thought in this coin is the triumph of Christianity over paganism as it pierces the serpent through. And this is what we have in Revelation chapter 12. Christ prevails over the serpent and cast him out out of heaven, that is, from the throne of the Roman Empire. Here we can see some more coins of Constantine and also Magnetius, who was a later Christian emperor of this same era. Now note that on either side of the XP or the Chi Rho are the Greek letters Alpha and Omega, which signifies Jesus Christ. What's quite interesting about this point is that this is the way Jesus Christ names himself four times in the book of Rev Revelation, the very book that deals with this prophecy. Also, the context of this title appearing at this time in history with the collapse of the pagan Roman Empire, and then also right at the very end in Revelation chapter 22, shows that the prophecy contains a foreshadowing of Christ's ultimate return and the upheaval he will bring then. It is, after all, this fourth world empire that his kingdom of stone will eternally replace and there's going to be a great and violent shaking as this occurs. Revelation 22 verse 12, And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Amen. Edward Gibbon talks about this under the subheading Propagation of Christianity, and he's referring to Constantine I, and he says this, The gratitude of the Church has exalted the virtues and excused the failings of a generous patron who seated Christianity on the throne of the world. In the Horae Apocalyptica, Eliot quotes the church historian Eusebius, who lived to see all of these things come to pass, and he said, The event surpassed all words. Soldiers with naked swords kept watch around the palace gate, but the men of God passed through the midst of them without fear and entered the heart of the palace. And they sat down, some at the emperor's table, the rest at tables either side of this. It looked like the image of the very kingdom of Christ and was altogether more like a dream than reality. And again from Eusebius, Whereas the saints and confessors before our time sang of God's wonderful interventions on behalf of his people as a thing of the past, behold those wonders we now see acted out before our own eyes. 
the emperor, dear to God, sustained an empire which was the image of the heavenly empire, and ruled it in imitation of him who was greater than all, the supreme lord of the world. The kingdom and empire of Constantine is as resplendent as an image of the kingdom of heaven. Well, it couldn't get any better than this. Little did Eusebius know what was in store for the church in the future. It seems clear that he was over-infatuated with Constantine, and as Gibbon rightly said, the gratitude of the church exalted the virtues and excused the failings of a generous patron. This is the end of Revelation chapter 12, part 3.